So there's new technology out there that some people are saying is going to completely reinvent broadcast media. I'm a little dubious because it seems like the first thing that's been happening is people have been live streaming the contents of their refrigerator. Who knows if it's the next big thing, but it's definitely had a lot of buzz in the last few months. So I'm Deborah Jasper. And I'm Betsy Hubbard. And this is Mindset Digital's Fast Focus. And we're really going to start today by talking about Meerkat. You got to love the name. Tell me more about it. So Meerkat is a live streaming app. What does that mean? It means with the push of a button, you can share video that you're capturing live in real time and you can share it out from your phone. But here's the thing. So we've always been able to share video. Why is this such a big deal? Yeah, but we've not always been able to share video in real time. It used to be that you'd record video and then you'd have to go back and then you'd upload it and then you'd find a way to share it. But now with the live streaming apps, you're sharing it out directly. And people seem to love this. Well, yeah, people are. I mean, people have flocked to it because it's new and it's interesting and it can be fun. Now, what about Periscope? What's the deal there? So Twitter turns around the very same month and launches Periscope, which is their own version of a live streaming app. Does about the same thing, but it integrates really nicely with Twitter. So it's super easy to send this out to the Twitterverse. At the same time, they made it a whole lot harder for Meerkat users to share their content on Twitter. Okay, so this sounds like a really intense competition. A lot of fun to watch, a lot of media coverage. What's next with this? Yeah, well, maybe Meerkat hasn't found it quite as much fun, but they have figured out how to respond. They've gone to Facebook, and now Meerkat integrates really nicely with Facebook. They also were the first to launch an Android app, so they're still out there, and they have a big audience as well. Okay, so we're going to have to keep a close eye on this. What I find interesting about all of this is that the first thing that people really wanted to do with live streaming is things like hashtag fridge view where they had contents of their fridge or someone was telling me yesterday that he had a blast actually live streaming a puppy in Toronto playing with an ice cube which is you know kind of where we where we go first but that's not the only kind of stuff we're live streaming no and and of course even the news outlets think that this is cool and so they're using it too they're using it as a way to get out their content you know just look at the guardian or the washington post Washington Post was using it the other week to live stream Pulitzer Prize announcements. So you could get an inside look at what was going on in the newsroom when they were announcing awards to their journalists. Does this make people nervous, though? Because that seems really intimate. And what if you're hanging out in an office and people are live streaming and you don't know it? (laughs) Yeah, there's lots of problems. So media companies are using it, but they're also scared of it because stuff like this is happening. Just uh, think about that live, that huge boxing match that just happened, the Mayweather-Pacquiao match. People were paying big bucks to watch that on pay-per-view, but other folks were live streaming it across Twitter. So we have all sorts of copyright issues here, and it's going to take a long time to sort through this. Okay, so the conversation's only probably going to get more intense. I have no doubt we'll be seeing a lot of big fights over this, so we'll definitely have to stay tuned. A lot of buzz now. It's too early probably to say if it's a real game changer, but definitely something to watch. We'll be tracking it. And we will be reporting out. We'll keep you posted on what's going on there. So what's next? Well, now we're going to turn to Pam and Spencer, and they're going to tell you the latest updates on some of the social networks. Because there are always latest updates. With 1.4 billion users worldwide, Facebook is still the dominant social network. 58% of adult Americans are on Facebook. And the fastest growing demographic? Seniors age 65 or older. But what's worth noting is the growth of Facebook as a video platform. The company announced earlier this year that it has surpassed 3 billion video views per day on the site, more than tripling the daily views in the six months between June and December 2014. More than 65% of those views are occurring on mobile devices, and Facebook reported that more than half of all daily visitors in the U.S. watch at least one video. New features allow users to upload a video to Facebook, but then share it easily elsewhere on the web, just like on YouTube or Vimeo. In fact, some studies are showing that many video creators are moving from YouTube to Facebook exclusively, because engagement around videos on Facebook tends to be higher. User videos uploaded to Facebook play automatically in the news feed, whereas an embedded YouTube video requires the user to click to play. Both video engagement and total plays skyrocketed when Facebook first rolled out autoplay. So it's no surprise that autoplay video ads weren't far behind. 
native Facebook videos now get more reach than any other type of post, which may be what's behind CEO Mark Zuckerberg's recent statement that the network will be mostly video in five years. So when you add Facebook's 3 billion video views to the additional 2 billion photos shared daily on Facebook and Instagram, you can begin to understand the scope of the reaction when both Facebook and Instagram went down for much of the U.S. for about an hour earlier this year. The unexpected outage sent hashtag Facebook down to the top of trending topics on Twitter. The takeaway here? If you're looking to increase your engagement on Facebook, you better start thinking video. Guess who had a birthday last month? Twitter did. It's been nine years since the 140 character tweet was unleashed on the world. In celebration, the company selected its choices for 10 most influential tweets of all time. So where is Twitter at nine? The latest Pew Research report puts Twitter at more than 280 million users worldwide. In the US, 19% of Americans 18 and over are on Twitter. That's almost one in every five U.S. adults. While the launch of Periscope made a lot of news last month, Twitter also unveiled some new, useful features worth noting. Chief among them, Twitter now lets any user receive direct messages from any other user. Before, direct messaging could only be used between mutual followers. Now, wide open direct messaging may increase the amount of time users spend on Twitter and hopefully increase engagement across the platform. The new While You Were Away feature collects together tweets from those you follow that occurred while you were logged out. It's an easy way to skim through what was tweeted while you were away. And you may have seen a number of new types of digital ads on Twitter lately. The company has been trialing new types of ads, including autoplay video ads in your feed, ads on your profile page, and carousel style ads on the mobile interface. But the biggest news for Twitter this past quarter was the deal it announced with Google to provide direct access to its stream of tweets, what many people call the fire hose. While Google can and does crawl Twitter for search results, access to the fire hose could mean your tweets will start showing up in search results more quickly than ever before. We'll have to wait to see how this deal plays out for both Twitter and for SEO efforts. While the companies announced the deal in February, an implementation is still several months away. Thanks, Spencer and Pam. Before we go, let's take a quick look at who's been killing it on social media. It's time for hashtag for the win. I think today we're talking Pinterest, 70 million users, and surprisingly, 30% of them are millennials. So that makes it attractive to big brands who are trying to reach millennials, brands like banks. Bank of America has been smart here. They know there's a lot of millennials on there, but they also know that they aren't that interested in talking about auto loans and home mortgages. Especially on Pinterest, I imagine. That would not be the channel I'd be going to to connect with my bank. That's right. So what did Bank of America do? Instead, they started producing content around things people do care about, especially millennials. Things like planning for a baby, buying a house, uh, planning a wedding. And they created unique and highly visual content. They created infographics that were worthy, really worth sharing. So rather than promote products, they were engaging in lifestyle conversations. It's funny because then suddenly I see all these millennials with all these images and all this financial information in their Pinterest pages, not how you think about Pinterest. So cool for Bank of America. It was a smart strategy and it's worked for them. They have some of the top ranked content on Pinterest and they've gotten publicity off the channel as well. So New York Times has written about them and Ad Age. So it worked because they weren't pitchy, they weren't pitching, they were actually really giving people the kind of content they want. So interestingly, even banks, I guess, can connect with people authentically on Pinterest. Okay, so good hashtag for the win. Nice work, Bank of America. This wraps up the Fast Focus update. We will be back. And we will be talking about the next round of Trends and Developments. And there's always a new round of Trends and Developments, so we will see you soon.